forgiveness of sins that we find there, the hope and, and just eternal life. And Lord, we pray that you would lead us to the cross even while the flesh within us wants to run away and hide. Because the cross represents self-denial, the cross represents sacrifice. But the cross also represents love and hope and forgiveness and peace and the joy of Christ. So Father, this morning, speak to us through your word, through your spirit, and draw us closer to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 6. We're wrapping up our uh, series called The Project. Uh, We're coming to a point of completion, so we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. If you don't have a a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. That's why we have them there. And uh, turn to page 508, because I have one just like those. And uh, if you need a Bible... Take one of these with you when you leave. We'd love for you to have the Word of God and to let it be part of your life. Hey, while uh, you're finding Nehemiah chapter 6, next week we're kicking off a series called Contentment. And we're going to be talking about uh, what the Bible says it takes for us to live a contented life. And so uh, uh, if you know somebody who's just a malcontent, they're discontent, they're grumpy, they're mean, they're angry, they're frustrated, all that kind of stuff, this is for them. So bring them next week with you. You're like, really? i got to bring them? Hey, look, God can change their life. God can change your life. And so uh, now this is for all of us as we talk about contentment. I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll bring someone with you that is uh, looking to grow in their contentment. Today we are finishing our series about Nehemiah and his uh, task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And as we've been looking at Nehemiah's project of reconstruction of Jerusalem, we've been talking about and paralleling that with our project to build here at Calvary. And, uh, and I, in case you don't know what we're doing here at Calvary, we own uh, 12 acres on Sweetwater Avenue, which is uh, right across the highway from Dairy Queen, because I know you all know where Dairy Queen is, right? And, uh, and so uh, just like they serve up sweet things, so do we, but uh, we're on the other side of the highway, and uh, we're going to be building a worship center that seats about 900, uh, roughly twice as big as this. Uh, we uh, are going to have great children's space so that we can take care of the, the little ones who uh, are part of our families. And, uh, and we're doing this because our mission here at Calvary, our purpose, is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And, and we've identified in this series that there are 35 to 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. And, and it's our mission, it's our task to share the gospel with them and to provide them some place to come and worship. And obviously they're not going to fit in here. It's kind of full in here. And so, uh, so we're building, enlarging uh, our sanctuary, our space. Uh, and that's phase one. We're planning on moving everything there eventually. So uh, that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing it. And over the course of the series, we've challenged everyone to ask God what he would have you to do. Uh, to participate in this uh, project. And some of you have volunteered already and you started serving in new ministry positions. And that's exciting. We've asked everyone to, to really get real with God and ask him, what do you want us to give to this project? Uh, in the last 30 months since we started Sweetwater Crossing, we've raised as a church over $1.1 million dollars towards the project. That's really cool, uh, but the project's a $4 million project, and so we're just challenging everyone to say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And then to do it. And, uh, and we people have been asking about when we're going to break ground, uh, and I just want you to know we're getting close to that. We've got a contractor. Uh, we're working out all the, the details, crossing T's, dotting I's with the uh, contractor, with the banks, and they're looking to break ground the week of Thanksgiving. So, yeah, some of you are like, oh, really? Seriously? You're going to do this? Yeah, it's only been 11 years on the, on the journey since we brought the property. So, uh, uh, that said, because they're looking to break ground uh, in November, we're going to have a formal groundbreaking service. And we're going to do that Wednesday, November the 12th at 8 o'clock in the morning. Wednesday, November 12th at 8 o'clock. Yes, that's a weird time, but we don't do anything normal here at Calvary. So, uh, we're, we're doing that because it coincides with chapel at Calvary Christian Academy. And so we're going to be on the property. The service is going to be on the property, not here. Uh, and uh, with the whole school and uh, everyone is invited. 
And if you've got kids in the public schools, um, they can be late that day. I'm giving you permission, okay? <laughs> Perfectly fine with me. You're the parents. You can decide when they go to school anyway. Uh, and, and you know what? Your kids will love it. Uh, bring them on down and, you know, treat them to Starbucks and donuts on the way uh, to school. They'll even think, they'll think you're the best parents in the world. So uh, it's all good. So uh, uh, that's the, the plan, so I hope you can participate uh, with us on that day. But really, the main thing is that we're moving ahead on the project. So we're finishing our series about Nehemiah, so let's talk about Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem. Um, if you're not familiar with the Nehemiah story, here's, here's a, the story in a nutshell, the 30-second catch-up, if you will. Nehemiah was born in exile. He was one of the Jewish people that had been carried away by Babylon when they destroyed uh, the city of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. He, he was born into exile, never been there, and he was the servant of the king of Persia. Uh, when Persia defeated Babylon, they said to the Jews, you can go home. Some of them did. Uh, Nehemiah, though, was a servant to the king, and, and he heard about Jerusalem, the condition of the walls, the distress of the city, and, and God put it on his heart for him to go and build the walls. And he asked the king for permission. The king said, sure, you can go. Uh, gave him resources, and Nehemiah went to Jerusalem and said, hey, we can build the walls. And the people said, okay, we're going to do this. And the first thing we see today is that, that they completed the task. They got it done. They completed the task. Uh, look at chapter 6 of Nehemiah, verses 15 and 16. It says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. This is an incredible, miraculous, amazing accomplishment. The, the fact that they built the wall, think about this. The wall had been broken down for more than 70 years. Between 70 and 80 years, it had been laying there in a pile of rubble. Nehemiah shows up, and they rebuild the wall in 52 days. 52 days. Even their neighbors, even their enemies understood that God was involved in this. And the, uh, the Israelites understood that God was involved in this. So after they completed the task, they honored God. Flip over one page to Nehemiah chapter 8. Look at the first three verses. This is how they honored God. It said, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They, they all got together, kind of like we are in a church service, but uh, they didn't have seats and stuff like that. They gathered outside a huge group of them, and they listened to the Law of Moses. Uh, law of Moses, it's the first five books of our Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. So can you imagine gathering and standing for five to six hours while someone read the first five books of the, of the Bible? Okay, well, why don't you guys go home and try that with your kids? They'll love it, right? Guys, just stand here. I'm going to read this to you. And so they stood there and they listened to the word of God. They listened to the story of how God revealed himself to them and how God made them a nation and how God in his power delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And they listened to God's commands about how to live as the people of God. And uh, they knew the project had been accomplished because of the power of God. And they wanted to thank God and they did that by paying attention to him, listening to him. So they honored God, and then they rejoiced. They rejoiced. Now, this is an interesting story of rejoicing. Uh, skip down to verses 9 and 10. Uh, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept, as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't be grieved. 
They, now, it's interesting because they were rejoicing. They gathered together to, to honor God and to celebrate this accomplishment. And the people were told, you have to celebrate. Because what happened was they heard God's word read to them and they were convicted because they were not living according to the word of God. And as they listened to the word, their hearts were were pierced and they suddenly became sorrowful for how they were living their lives. Now, by the way, they were not the first generation to ignore the, the word of God. That really, pretty much from the, from the time of King David to the time of Nehemiah, 500 years, they mostly had lived in rebellion. They had done abominations before God. They had worshipped other gods. They did all kinds of sick and twisted and perverted things in the temple that were not of God. They, they, except for a few occasions where they had good kings that actually said, hey, everybody, knock this stuff off, and they threw out the idols, they really had lived a horrible life of disobedience before God. And that's why God had judged them and and Jerusalem had been destroyed and they had been carried into exile. And so now they listened and they went, wow, this is terrible. Look at how we're living. we got to change. And and Nehemiah tells them, stop whining and weeping. Dry your tears and go home and celebrate. Go home and throw a party. Break out the wine. Get the meat. Have some of your neighbors over and you guys throw a party because of what God has done. Stop crying over what you've done. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And all the people are like, okay, we're going to go home and have a party now. I'm going to wipe my tears. <laughs> Tell the neighbors to come over. We're going to have some fun. It's going to be a great day. All right? Isn't that what he's telling them? Put on your big boy pants and have some fun. Celebrate the goodness of God. Now, just so you know, because that's such a weird scene, uh, that that this was the generation, these were the people who changed the course of the history of Israel. Because from this generation on, they stopped being a people of rebellion against God's law, and they started living it. In fact, from Nehemiah to the time of Jesus, about 500 years, they were obedient to the law at every point. They, they followed it. You see it at the time of Jesus. In fact, they were so obsessive over the law of God that when God showed up in their midst, they missed it. That's how seriously they took this law. And so their dedication, their zeal changed everything for 500 years of their history. That's pretty amazing. That's enough about Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem. Let's talk about the people of Calvary. Um. The applications we're about to discuss are for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, personal, your sins, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made an intentional, serious commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then what we're going to talk about applies to you. If you haven't made that decision yet, then listen in, please, and hear our, and understand our worldview and how we see life. Because then maybe you'll want to join us in it. Uh, so first of all, what tasks have you completed? What tasks have you completed? What successes have you accomplished? What has God helped you build or do or become in your life? What have you completed? Um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 30 seconds And I want you to share one or two things that you can say, I know God helped me do this. I know God helped me complete this in your life with someone around you. Okay, 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. All right, time's up. Yeah, you guys, you guys went on talking longer than most of the services uh, this weekend. So uh, either you just met some people that you really liked or uh, you're really excited about the things you've accomplished. Hey, was that difficult for anyone to do? Okay. Some are saying yes, some are saying no, uh, which is how it's been every service. See, we want you to look at your life 
and see what God has built in your life. Every good and perfect gift you have in your life is from God. And so uh, it, it is right to look back and say, God, you've done these things in my life. Uh, so have you uh, graduated, you know? If you finished high school or college or post-grad, then, then recognize that as an accomplishment. And, and some of you are wondering, hey, does kindergarten count graduation? <laughs> Only if you're like eight years old right now. Um, have you been licensed professionally? Have you achieved some kind of certification so that you can do your job in a, in a way? Uh, do you have a job? Uh, have you gotten promoted? You know, have you retired? All of those are accomplishments. Uh, are you married? Do you have children or grandchildren? Do, do they still want to talk to you? Uh, <laughs> see, that, that's an accomplishment. That's something that God's built. Have you made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life? Have you declared that to the world in baptism? Have you found a way to serve God and use your gifts and abilities to bless people? Yes. Have you uh, used your influence to lead someone else into or toward a relationship with Jesus Christ? See, all of these are accomplishments, things that God has built into your life. Have you achieved a, a place of sobriety where you can celebrate, you know, whether it's a days, weeks, months, years, decades uh, of overcoming an addiction? See, these are accomplishments. These are things that God has built into your life, tasks that you've completed. And, and we want you to, uh, to look at your life, see your life, and see what you have built, see what God has done, and honor God. So are you honoring God? Are you honoring God for the successes, for the accomplishments, for the blessings that he has poured out into your life? As we mentioned before, everything good in your life is because God is involved. So we honor God when we give God the credit. The people of Jerusalem built the wall. They were celebrating 52 days. They got it. Their hands were dirty, their backs were sore, their bodies were tired, yet they praised God. They recognized that God is the, is the one who gave them the strength to finish. God is the one who protected them from their enemies. God is the one who sent Nehemiah to them. God is the one who gave them the favor of the king. And so all of these things that they accomplished were because God was involved. Their enemies understood it. They understood it. And so they gave God the credit. Now, just a minute ago, I asked you guys to share about the things built in your life. And some of you struggled to name any accomplishments or completions in your life. In fact, you're really thankful that I said one, because if it had been more than that, you would have been like at a loss. And you need to see more of the successes that God has built into your life. But others of you had no problem naming the accomplishments, but you struggle to give God the credit for his work in your life. See, sometimes we, we kind of look at our lives and go, yeah, but I did it. And it's like, you don't have the strength, you don't have the intelligence, you don't have the energy, you don't have the, the possibilities without the blessings of God. We need to see that. See, I can confess to you that I know uh, that I am who I am solely and completely because of Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's the only reason. Because not only did God forgive my sins and promise heaven, but he delights in taking losers and lost causes and demonstrating his power in their lives. So are you honoring God by giving him credit? And are you honoring God by hearing God's word? Hearing God's word. They, they listened to God's word. And, and when they listened to God's word, God spoke to them and, and it led them to change their lives. And, and, and they heard God's word and they made decisions that impacted generation after generation after generation of Israelites. I want you to know that every decision you make, good or bad, is going to have an impact on the people who follow you, on your families, on the people who know you. You have a ripple effect with your life and your decisions that, that will go way beyond what you see. That's why every decision matters. As Calvary, every decision we make as a church will have an impact on the community of Lake Havasu City, and for good or for bad. And that's why we want to make wise decisions. I'm pretty sure you want to make wise decisions for your life. And, and the way that we make wise decisions is by hearing God's word. Hearing God's word. God tells us how to live in this book. He tells us how to be wise in this book. Which, by the way, is why we're glad that you're here. 
because you're hearing God's word at this moment. That's why we're glad and, and encourage people to join life groups and Bible studies because we want you to gather with other people and, and open God's word and talk about it and apply it to your life and have those kind of relationships of accountability where you can encourage each other and sometimes even rebuke each other. You see, because those are important for us hearing God. That's why we give away Bibles. And, and, you know, not just cheap ones. We give away good ones because we believe this is worth the investment in your life because we know that if you read it, if you put it in your life, your life will be changed because of the power of the Word of God. And you can't honor God without hearing and applying His Word to your life. It's that simple. So are you honoring God? Do you recognize the accomplishments that God has built into your life and are you honoring God? And then will you celebrate? Will you celebrate? The, the people of Jerusalem were a little bit reluctant to celebrate, but Nehemiah said, hey, go throw a party. You need to, you need to celebrate. And by the way, that is consistent with all of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, uh, you just got to love him. He says in Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. In 1 Thessalonians 5.16, he was a little more succinct. He said, rejoice always. So when are we supposed to rejoice? Always. Yeah, always. Do we do that? <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. You see, we're supposed to live in a, a life in such a way that we, we see the marvelous things that God has done that you were just sharing with one another a few moments ago. That we understand that we are forgiven of our sins by Jesus Christ. That, that we experience the love of God and the grace of God. And, and, and that God is with us. And, and then we're supposed to throw a party. And literally, as Jesus people, we are supposed to live our lives rejoicing and celebrating. So much so that our lives become a celebration of God's goodness. Isn't that cool? Our, our lives are supposed to reflect the joy of Christ so much so that... that People see us, and they know that Jesus is in us. That, that's literally what, what Paul is telling us to, to live like. And, and yet, we know that we struggle to celebrate and rejoice. And we do it for the same reason as the people of Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah. We look back, and we see our failures. We look back at our life, and I, I just ask you to share your successes, but it's so much easier if I'd ask you to share your failures, right? Because we look back and we have those regrets, and we look back and we go, wow, well, you know, I see my mistakes, and I, I wish I'd done that differently. <laughs> I wish I hadn't done that at all, <laughs> you know? And, and we think uh, about those, and, and, you know, a lot of us grew up in churches where guilt was kind of poured on us. Look at all these bad things you've done. Look at all these mistakes that you've made. Look at all this stuff. And, and, and so we learn, like the people of Jerusalem, we, we kind of learn to start looking at our lives and weeping because we understand that we have disappointed God. We understand that we've rebelled against God. We've under, we understand that we have pretty much just messed our lives up. And, and so we get stuck in that place of sorrow. And a lot of times churches are the ones who helped us get stuck there. And that's because we don't understand repentance. We think repentance is being sorrowful about our past sins and mistakes. But according to the Bible, that's only the launching point of repentance. I want you to understand that repentance is about next. It's not about the past. Repentance is about what you do going forward, not about what you did yesterday. Or long ago. Repentance is about the, the reality that God has a future for every single one of us where he wants to bless us and lead us to life if we will take hold of it. It's not about agonizing over the mistakes that we have made because God can redeem those if we'll follow him. See, that's the reality of repentance. It, being sorry for your sin or grieving your sin is not repentance. I mean, let me just be really clear about this. If you grew up in churches like I did, you know, they had altar calls at the end of services. You guys with me? And, and so at the end of service, they'd encourage you to come forward and repent. And, and so people would come forward and they'd kneel at the altar, the steps, you know, because it wasn't really like a fancy altar or anything. They'd kneel at the steps and they would pray and they would cry and they would weep and they'd, you know, call out to God and that kind of stuff. And, 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 uh, and sometimes it made a difference, but usually it didn't. Truthfully, 
Usually it didn't. And I've actually had people who kind of confronted me, if you will, they rebuked me because we don't do that here at Calvary. Well, you should do this. You should invite people. They come forward. They want to fall on their face. They want to call out to God. They want to kneel. They want to weep. They want to cry. Isn't that what you want? And I freaked about because I said, no, it's not what I want. I don't want you to live in a place of sorrow. I want you to live in a place of repentance because it's not about weeping here that matters. What matters is when you walk out the door, is your life different because of Jesus? Because you heard the word of God and you applied the word of God and you're living differently. That's what repentance actually looks like. And you see, uh, here's how the Apostle Paul put it. 2 Corinthians seven ten. He said, for godly grief or sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. So it's not looking back and going, I wish I hadn't done that. But worldly grief produces death. You ever been around someone who's just stuck in grief? Or sorrow. You see, there's a uh, you know grief process that people are supposed to work their way through. You're supposed to be sad, and then you get angry, and and then you come to you know realization. And you, but you make progress. You you move through it. It's tough to be around people who camp out in that place. Same is true in church. There's some of us who just are camping out in our sorrow but we're not making any changes to our life. And see, the way the Bible describes it, conviction leads us to sorrow, which leads us to change. Change equals repentance. And when we live in repentance, then we live in the joy and the life that Christ has for us. Here's what it looks like in, in my relationship with my wife. I've been married for 30 years. Uh, we got a great marriage, but I annoy my wife something fierce. <laughs> and, and there was a particular way that I really, really annoyed her. And, uh, and it had... Nothing to do with intentionality. It's just the, the different systems of family that we came out of. I annoyed her because I didn't put my dirty dishes in the dishwasher. I put them in the sink. I thought getting them to the sink was a victory, but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't, okay? And, and see, the difference was her family put dirty dishes in the dishwasher. My family put dirty dishes in the sink. That was just how we were raised, and I kept saying that's just how I was raised, and she'd get annoyed, and I would say, I'm sorry. And when she'd get really annoyed... I'd buy her flowers. <laughs> Not the expensive ones, you know, just the cheap grocery store ones that were on sale or whatever. And, and that was my way of saying, I'm sorry and I mean it. But she just continued to get annoyed because I just keep leaving them in the sink. And, and finally, one day she was so annoyed, she said, don't tell me you're sorry and don't buy me flowers. <laughs> and I went, score. <laughs> I just saved money. Until I realized that now my only option was to repent. Because if I wanted to be the husband God called me to be, if I wanted to be the husband who loved his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, then I had to put her needs ahead of my needs, which meant my only option is not saying I'm sorry anymore, but it's actually changing my behavior. And when I came to that realization, I went, okay, it doesn't matter how I was raised. It doesn't matter what excuses I'm using. I need to start trying to put my dirty dishes in the dishwasher. And so for years, I've been trying to do that. Sometimes I succeed. Sometimes I fail. She's much less annoyed at me now. <laughs> Why? Because I repented. I didn't just say, I'm sorry. And how many times do we get stuck just living out the I'm sorry's? I'm sorry I came home drunk again. Doesn't mean anything. Until you stop. To the abuser who apologizes after he beats his wife and his kids. Doesn't mean anything. Until you repent and change your behavior. To the porn addict who stumbles again and feels so bad, so guilty. I'm so sorry God, I, I didn't want to look at that but I did. But yet hasn't put accountability software on his computer. I'm sorry doesn't mean anything. To the gossip who destroys another friendship or, or, or causes conflict among friends because they just can't stop slandering and spreading lies. I'm sorry just doesn't mean it. It's empty words. It's weeping at an altar and then going back to your same lifestyle. And, and that's not what repentance is about. Repentance is about what you do next, not what you did in the past. We've all got those sins that are holding on to us that pull us back and we stumble and we apologize a thousand times to God for. But if we're going to live in that celebration of life, if we're going to 
if we're going to really celebrate our salvation, our forgiveness of sins, the presence of God, his, his abundant blessings, the reality that nothing can stop us from getting to heaven, if we're going to really live in that joy, then we got to let God change our lives. And it doesn't matter how you failed in the past. Look, the promise of Scripture is this. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all of your sin. All of it. It's about what we're doing going forward, how we're going to live from this point on. So today is a new start. Are you going to begin a new project life today? Because if God can build a wall that's been laying broken for 70 years and 52 days, he can rebuild your life. So don't tell God you're sorry. Let God change your life. That's what Jesus came to do. Will you pray with me? Father, you know all those ways that we're stuck. You know all those things that we've repented of or said we're sorry for time and time and time again. And today, we're asking you to give us the courage to change, the faith to change. We're inviting you, we're begging you to do whatever it takes in our lives to move us to that place of freedom, to live in that place of joy and celebration. So God, give us the courage to show up at Celebrate Recovery tomorrow night. Give us the courage to make an appointment with a counselor. Give us the courage to confess to our spouse or a pastor or a friend. Give us the courage to change. Because you came to set us free. So Lord, rebuild our lives. Do whatever it takes to accomplish that. Because we want to live in the joy of repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.